The Nestorian heresy is unique among the many heresies we're studying in this class. Nestorianism is unique on two counts. First, this heresy does not directly compromise the humanity of Jesus, nor does it directly compromise the divinity of Jesus. Where it falls into error is its attempt to articulate how the humanity and divinity of Jesus come together and unite in the God-man Jesus Christ. It is also unique for a second reason. Nestorius, a 5th century bishop of Constantinople, blamed for this heresy of Nestorianism, well, he himself was never a Nestorian. What happened? Nestorius got into a row with another church father, Cyril of Alexandria. And Cyril of Alexandria was a bit of a crank. And he was quite envious of Nestorius for all sorts of reasons. The problem is the outcome of this row, of this conflict, was that Nestorius got slandered. When you look at the scholarship of people who are expert in the fathers of the church, people who focus on the church fathers as central to their scholarship, the majority of them, practically all of them, will tell you that Nestorius was never Nestorian, that he never developed or advocated for anything like this. So what we have here is a cautionary tale. What we have here is a warning whereby when we in the church forget the grace of God, forget our divine mission to serve God and God's truth, and forget to serve one another in charity, in love, we wind up slandering good people, including poor Nestorius. So, now that we know the truth behind Nestorius himself, what is the Nestorian heresy? What's its problem? Why is the orthodox rebuttal to it important for us and our relationship with God? Nestorianism was developed by a few people, and I have two of them on the board. The first was Paul of Samosata, and he was someone who wrote the rough sketch of Nestorianism. Paul of Samosata argued that Jesus is God by virtue, not by nature. What's wrong with that? Let's turn to someone who wrote a full-blown Nestorianism, Theodore of Mopsuestia. And Theodore of Mopsuestia argued that the humanity and divinity of Jesus was united as a matter of will, was united as a matter of morals. What does that mean? It means that the humanity of Jesus freely conformed to the divinity of Jesus. It freely assented to the divinity of Jesus in morals, in conforming the human will to the divine will, it was basically a voluntary relationship between the humanity and the divinity. And perhaps the motive behind that was to preserve the complete freedom of Jesus Christ to be Jesus Christ. He freely followed the will of the Father, freely fulfilled his mission, and that included his human nature and divine nature, which was together as a matter of a free, voluntary relationship. What's wrong with that? Well, look at it this way. Suppose the Nestorians are right, and Jesus' humanity freely conformed with the divinity. Well, then ask yourself, how was Jesus Christ acceptable to God the Father as Messiah? It has to be because his humanity freely and fully and perfectly conformed to his divinity. Now ask yourself this, do human beings and our human selves, do we always and everywhere freely and fully and perfectly conform to God? No, we don't. Even with God's grace, where we grow in virtue and in holiness and learn to sin less and less, still we do not achieve full perfection this side of heaven. So that means that if this is right, then our salvation is compromised. Because for us to be accepted, accepted by God, we have to imitate Christ. And if Christ set a standard where to be accepted by God the Father, humanity has to perfectly, always and everywhere, conform ethically and as a matter of will to the divinity. If Jesus models that, we have to, in order to be saved, model that too. And the bottom line is, we can't. The good news from Orthodox teaching is we don't have to. 
Yes, we must make every effort to not sin, to grow in sin and to grow in holiness. However, Orthodox teaching t tells us that God meets us where we are. Here is why. Orthodox teaching says that Jesus Christ's humanity and divinity is together as a matter of ontology, as a matter of being. Now, you know from other videos that ontology means being. It means the nature that we have received from God. So, in another video we talked about how human beings have an ontology. We have a received being from God mediated through billions of years of evolution. So, we have a received being whereby human beings are ontologically male and female. And to change that would be to do violence to our essential selves, our ontological selves. And with Jesus Christ, he is ontologically the God-man. His humanity and divinity are together as a matter of being. To put it another way, Jesus Christ cannot not be the God-man. He cannot choose to be something other than he essentially is. He cannot tear apart his natures. He cannot mix his natures together. He is a God-man, no matter what. Now, does that compromise Jesus' freedom? No, it does not. Because if we are created to be a certain being, then we're given, as part of that, a telos. Telos is a Greek word which means end. So we, as human beings, have an end. An end to become fully realized human beings. Now, we have this shared telos where we are supposed to be people who are holy, where we're supposed to be people of virtue. We have that shared telos, but we're also unique human beings. God made us each unique. So how we achieve our telos of being ethical, of being holy, that's going to attain a unique characteristic from person to person. So on the one hand, we're not utter, we're not automatons, where we go our own way, but on the other hand, we're not, um, we're not um, mindless Borg, where we conform utterly to every, to, 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 every last, to every last thing. The beauty of God's creation is that there are unique ways of attaining the same overall end, which is being virtuous and being holy, in union with God. So, where does freedom come in? Our freedom is to become who we ought to be as human beings, and Jesus is free the same way. Jesus is free to fully realize who he is made to be by God the Father. God the Father made him the God-man. He is ontologically human and divine, and his freedom is to attain fully that mission that God the Father set him on earth to do. And the beauty of having a God-man who is human and divine is that it reveals something about God's relationship with us. As I've talked about in other videos, the fact that Jesus Christ is human and divine from the word go tells us something about God and his relationship with us. It means that because God fully assumed a human nature, it means that God accepts us where we are, despite our sin. Remember, sin is not supposed to be part of human nature. Jesus is modeling who we ought to become and lays out a path to follow so that we can become Christ-like and grow in virtue and grow in holiness and grow closer to the standard of perfection that Jesus sets. But the thing that makes this hopeful, as opposed to Nestorianism, is that by Jesus accepting us despite our sin, lays out a path where we're taken where we are and invited to join Jesus on a path to something greater. And there's more. Because Theodore almost splits Jesus Christ in two and says that this is a voluntary relationship, he has to also argue that Mary is not the mother of God, that Mary only gave birth to the humanity of Jesus, not the divinity. But with Orthodox teaching, the fact that Mary is the Theotokos, Theotokos meaning the mother of God, it's a Greek term which means mother of God, we're, we'll revisit this in future videos, it means that, Jesus, that Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ, 
God and man, a divine person, Jesus, with a fully assumed human nature. Mary gave birth to Jesus, a divine person, the God-man, fully assumed, with a, full, with a fully assumed human nature, which underscores this acceptance of humanity by God. If he did not want to accept humanity and bring humanity in communion to himself, not only would he have not assumed a full human nature, except sin, he also would not have bothered to come into the world the way all of us do, through a mother. So, our God is an awesome God, and bonus, he has a very nice mother. <laughs>